Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Colleen Hobday. Colleen is a claims advocate at Assurance with over six years of insurance experience with a background primarily in workers' compensation. Her experience lies within general industries, construction, and staffing. Colleen is responsible for assisting clients with all aspects of claims-related matters, and she relies on her knowledge of claims handling, best practices, and dedication to customer service for her accounts. Assurance is among the largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages in the United States. A top 50 broker, and repeated best place to work winner. Assurance places coverage for all forms of business and personal insurance, employee benefits, and retirement services. Through centralized offices located just outside of Chicago, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri, more than 200 passionate insurance professionals provide measurable results and personalized services to thousands of clients across the country. In today's Industry Insider webinar, Colleen will walk you through several advanced workers' compensation claims management techniques, including preparing for defense, modified duty programs, FMLA, effective use of surveillance, and fraud indicators. By the end of this session, you'll know how you can gain more control of your workers' compensation claims and your insurance destiny. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Colleen. Thanks, Amanda. Just one further introduction on our end. Um, my name is Kurt Murray. I'm a, a partner on the staffing team. Most of the time, my job is to structure, develop, and implement uh, insurance programs for our clients. But today, I'm going to be assisting Colleen um, really with the fielding of questions. So as questions come up in the Q&A section, I'll be either deferring those till the end of the presentation, if that makes sense, or asking Colleen during the middle of a particular section. So with that, Colleen. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna start with a basic overview of workers' compensation. Um, it's a no-fault system of benefits for injuries and illness um, related to employment. It covers all employees from the first day on the job. So first day, first minute on the jobs are covered. Um, each state administers its own unique laws, and the employer is um, responsible for the cost of insurance. Some basic uh, terminology used, TTD, which stands for temporarily totally disabled. Usually this is referenced um, with benefits, so the adjuster, if the um, injured worker is completely off work, or um, on restrictions that the employer is not able to accommodate, they issue um, TTD benefits, meaning they're obviously temporarily but totally disabled. Um, RTW stands for either return to work or release to return to work. Um, however, they may not be released to all previous duties. MMI, which stands for maximum medical improvement. Um, this is when the doctor releases the person from treatment. So they may still have some problems or pain, but um, at that point, the doctor's saying that there's nothing else they can do for them. Some states um, use the term end of healing. It differs um, between you know, different states. PPD, which stands for um, permanent partial disability. This is used with regards to settlement. Um, so it's saying that the person is you know, permanently but partially disabled. So let's say someone has surgery on their shoulder, the release from treatment, they may still have some, you know, deficiencies or, you know, ongoing pain with it, so they're permanently but only partially disabled. FMLA and modified duty. Um, the question often comes up if <clears throat> FMLA can run concurrent with workers' compensation. It can. 
However, you have to make sure that your HR department um, sends out a notice letter advising the injured employee that the FMLA will be running concurrent with their work comp claim. Um, it is something that you have to be consistent with. So you either have to do it for all employees, once they're out on work comp, they're on FMLA, or for no employees. Um, you do have to understand that um, once the ML FMLA is exhausted and the employee um, is terminated, you may lose some control of the claim, especially since you know they're obviously not working with you, there's no modified duty options, et cetera. Uh, so modified duty. Modified duty is a means to return the employee back to work during their healing time um, from the work-related injury. So essentially, if they're on some restrictions, you know, desk work only, or they can only lift a certain amount of weight, um, it's getting them back to work doing something. It is transitional in nature, and the job duty should be changed with the doctor's restrictions. So you want to make sure that you're getting a note after each follow-up from the employee that documents from the doctor what their restrictions are. The general rule regarding modified duty, it's a, um, if the transitional position extends past six months, it may be perceived to become a permanent position for them, and you may have some ADA issues. Um, however, this is something I would recommend you talk to your employment counsel about. Modified duty options. If the employer is unable to bring the employee back to work with restrictions, there are some other options. There are vendors out there that will find work for the employee within their current restrictions. Um, the employer does pay the employee during the time off. Um, a lot of the vendors will find work for them at you know, a not-for-profit agency, um, doing volunteer work, charity work, just something that they can do um, to keep them in a routine, get them out of the house, you know, make them get up, get dressed, talk to people, and just have them so they feel like they're doing something, they're involved in something. Um, and studies have shown that employees will return to work 50% sooner than if they're just allowed to remain at home during the healing period. And I really can't stress that enough because people just sitting at home, not having anything to do, it just, the claim goes on and on and on, it seems. Just getting them, keeping them on a schedule, Making them you know, interact with people is very good for them and obviously the claim. Hey, Colleen, a yep. question did just come in, so sure. if you could hold on a second. Mm -hmm. uh, question was, we're having trouble finding clients who can, who can provide modified duty work for injured employees. Do you have any suggestions how we can, we can build and develop light duty positions for our company? Um, I mean, you know, you really anything that you need done, you can work into a modified duty job. So you can ask around people, you know, if, if anybody needs help with certain things, if they're falling behind on something, they need help with filing, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be even for, you know, 40 hours a week. It can be for 20 hours a week, you know, a few hours a day, just something to get the person out of the house and into the work environment and just keep them so that they feel connected with people. So really anything, you know, that helping someone else at work, just anything really helps. And what would happen with, with the reimbursement for the employee's lost time if, say, that you were able to find light duty work for 20 hours and typically work in 40 hours? How would that, who, who would pay for that differential? The carrier would pay that differential. If it's a set amount, let's say they're, okay, they're only working 20 hours, they can just issue the checks weekly. If it, you know, might vary, then um, you or the injured worker can submit their uh, pay stub for that week to the employer, or to the carrier, sorry. <laughs> And then they issue um, the difference. It's usually two thirds of the difference that they issue to them. So, if, for example, a staffing agency had a higher compensated employee making, say, twenty dollars an hour, mm -hmm. but they're putting them in a more of a menial task in the office that normally would warrant a minimum wage, seven or eight dollars an hour, mm -hmm. can that be accommodated? Yeah, yeah, that, that would be as well? accommodated as well. And then who pays that wage differential? Again, that would be the carrier <clears throat> paying okay. the wage differential. So really, just anything you can, you know. But just to get them in the office, it, it makes a huge difference over the life of the claim. It really does. Okay. Okay, um, surveillance and independent medical exams. Um, some pros and cons of surveillance. So when to request it. Um, you need to realize that surveillance is costly, and it should not be overused. However, if the carrier you know objects to it or doesn't want to go through with it, and you really think that it's something that would be helpful, you can always contact your claims advocate and discuss you know, your rationale for that, and then they can go back to the adjuster to discuss further. 
Um, if you have reason to believe that the employee may be working on their own home or doing side jobs for someone else, that is something that happens a lot. Um, you know, they might have their own landscaping business or, um, you know, do something on the side. They're a carpenter. Um, you know, if you know that kind of stuff, it's really important to let the adjuster know that information because that helps when you go to do surveillance. If the medical records state that the employee continues to use aids to assist in movement, but sometimes people have them come into their actual location to pick up their check, you know, and if you notice that they're not, um, you know, using crutches or the cane or they seem to be doing just fine, that's also, you know, a bit of a red flag there. But you do need to remember that one day of good surveillance may not be sufficient. Um, it's frustrating, but often um, the claimant's attorney can just you know, say that the employee was just having a good day that day and it's not reflective of how they're doing on a normal basis. So that's why it's really important if you know outside things they might be doing, if they're involved in, you know, they play softball or they coach their, you know, child's team, anything that you know, let the adjuster know that because getting good surveillance is going to be really important. Uh, what you can expect from surveillance. If video is obtained substantially showing the employee active when the employee is restricted from all or most activities, this can be shown to either the treating doctor or the IME, so the independent medical exam doctor, for an opinion. So the adjuster can send in their surveillance video, you know, say, write to the doctor, say, you know, <clears throat> we have him on video doing, you know, A, B, whatever, um, and have them comment on, you know, can they be released at this time or can they return to work, depending on, you know, the case. Video can also be used um, at the time of settlement to reduce exposure on a claim. Um, you know, if you're, it's time of settlement, they can discuss it with the claimant's attorney. You know, we have them on video doing, you know, such and such, and kind of use it as a tool to get the settlement down. Or it can assist in taking the, um, the claim to trial for a possible win or a reduction in value. Independent medical exams. So what's the difference between an IME and a records review? An IME is an evaluation of the injured employee by a doctor for an opinion. It's usually a one-time thing. Um, they send the injured worker to the doctor with all the prior records. They evaluate them, give their opinion. Um, a records review is when a doctor um, reviewed only the medical records itself. They don't see the employee in person. Um, so they don't get any of the subjective complaints from you know, the injured worker. Um, this being said, obviously, the records review would hold more weight than an IME, but a records review is sometimes, you know, it can be very helpful um, in different ways than the IME. IMEs, much like surveillance, are costly um, and should be used on a case-by-case -case basis. That's something, you know, if you, if you do feel it's needed, you can discuss that with the adjuster. Um, they'll use them, for example, if somebody's you know, their treating doctors keeping them completely off work. Maybe they'll send him for an IME to say, you know, is he capable of doing some type of modified work? Or if they feel that the diagnosis doesn't correlate with the mechanism of injury, um, they'll use them for varied things. So if you feel that it may be one that's, you know, might be helpful on a particular claim, discuss that with the adjuster. Hey, Colleen, who has the yeah. ultimate authority to, to Use, utilize an IME? Is it rest with the client or with the insurance company or the adjuster? Um, the adjuster. I mean, if you really have valid reasons, they shouldn't be against having an IME or they should at least be able to lay out why they don't think that it's going to help. But it is up to them ultimately. But they like to hear from, you know, the employers. You're the first person, you know, you're the person that knows this employee. You're the one that sees them all the time. So if you have any information to share with them, it's always important to do that. Um, IMEs to be of any value should specialize in the part of the body in question. That kind of goes without, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but, um, you know, if you have a back injury, you'd want to send them to a spine specialist. And Colleen, can you, can you define or identify the difference between surveillance and what's called activity checks? Sure. Um, surveillance is obviously the full-blown, you know, you'd have them out there usually you start with like two days. Um, an activity check is just to, um, do they just kind of stop in, see, or stop over, I guess, by their house, see, you know, any um, physical activities they're doing, if, you know, kind of an employment check, see if they're doing anything. 
Um, it's really a cost-saving tool that you kind of do before deciding to do full-blown surveillance. Um, so that's that's sometimes a good idea too if the adjuster is kind of, you know, they don't want to maybe go to full-blown surveillance, maybe suggest an activity check and just kind of see if there's anything that maybe, um, you know, full surveillance would come in handy for. And is there also a way to a, to, to research or find prior medical records related to a uh, an alleged back injury, for example? Yeah, there are. Um, usually adjusters will try to get a signed medical authorization from the injured worker initially, and then um, when they go through and take their um, recorded statement, they'll get information, like if they have a primary care, if they had any prior injuries, obviously they don't always tell the truth, but usually they'll tell, you know, their primary care doctor and stuff, and then they can um, send a request to that doctor, or if defense is on the file, he can subpoena records, you know, if you know the area, or, you know, they can subpoena from different facilities and get prior records. It's something they actually do pretty often, adjusters, I would say. Okay, so um, preparing for defense. Remember that 90% of all claims are legitimate. It's the other 10% that drive us completely crazy. Um, the employee has, uh, if employees retain counsel and there are issues um, which are in dispute, it's generally at this time that defense is um, brought into the claim. Understanding what you can and cannot do may assist in the movement of the claim to conclusion, as well as prevent additional issues um, for the claimant's attorney to bring up. So what you can do, provide information to the adjuster to include payroll information prior to any hearings. That's very important if the adjuster is asking for stuff, especially if there is a hearing scheduled, get it to them as soon as you can. Um, have statements from any coworkers or supervisor forwarded to the adjuster. Um, this should ideally be done at the initial onset of the claim, but um, if it's not for whatever reason, you know, you just get the statements and get them over to the adjuster prior to the hearing. And also just confirm with the adjuster or defense counsel if, you know, you yourself or any witnesses need to be at trial to testify to anything. What you cannot do, you cannot discuss the merits of the claim with the employee. Um, you can, however, discuss the issues relative to return to work and their um, follow-up appointments. So, you know, they should be bringing in doctor's notes to you, either confirming that, you know, if they're off work, you know, they can have the doctor's office fax, anything, you know, but you should be able to get that information from them. Um, in the state of Illinois in particular, with regards to depositions, um, you cannot take depositions of the injured worker. However, um, they are allowed of the doctor folk experts, et cetera, that does vary a lot by state, so that's something to talk to your adjuster about or defense counsel about. Fraud and red flag indicators. Um, so you might think, you know, the accident never happened at all. Um, sometimes workers can get, you know, they're anticipating layoffs, so they think if I have a work comp claim, I can't be laid off. Um, they might you know, go ahead and stage an accident. If they have a pattern of claims, that's important. Um, you know, once they have a few claims, they get to know the system and know how to work it. Um, if they need time off, you know, maybe someone in their family is sick or if they have children. Um, children actually is, it can be a big red flag. Often I've seen where, you know, they might have three or four kids and obviously we all know daycare is very expensive. So if, um, you know, if they're home, they're off work, they're getting paid to be off, and they're not paying for daycare. Um, obviously, if they're a disgruntled employee, that's, you know, that could be a, a red flag right there. Um, some other red flag indicators, if the accident is not witnessed, um, rumors, people talk, employees talk, you know, they hear about things that their coworkers are doing. Um, so it's important to listen to that. Um, if the injury occurs in an area where the employee has no business being in in the first place, um, you know, if they're injured on the dock and there's absolutely no reason for them to be out there, that's, you know, a red flag. If the details are vague or contradictory, um, you know, if something just doesn't feel right to you, obviously if they're a problematic employee, um, often I would hear, you know, they've been written up a couple times, and now they, you know, of course, are right before they think they're going to get terminated, they're going to file a claim. Or even as they're being terminated, I've heard that a lot, um, they will, you know, say, well, I hurt my knee two months ago. So they report it as they're being terminated. Um, 
if they refuse, uh, refuse to follow company procedures or fill out an accident report, that's a red flag. Um, indicators of no injury, if it's an unwitnessed accident, or if it's witnessed by, you know, friends that are um, coworkers. Um, ambiguous, so the details are frequently changing. If they're overly specific, if it sounds um, rehearsed, I do find that often if somebody, you know, especially with like a trip and fall or something like that, they they can give you details, but not necessarily, you know, step by step. They might be able to say that they slipped on, you know, water and they fell, but maybe they're not 100% certain of how they actually fell, but they, you know, know that their shoulder hurts now. So if they're overly specific and it sounds like, you know, they have too many details, then if it sounds rehearsed, that's definitely a red flag. Um, pattern of claims. If they are, you know, again, pending possible termination, um, if there's layoffs, strikes, the holidays coming up. Workers' compensation fraud indicators. Um, the injury did not occur at the workplace. So accidents that occur on Friday afternoon and the employee doesn't report to anyone until Monday morning are a red flag. Um, even just early Monday morning, you know, um, reports in the first place. Was it something they were doing over the weekend and they decided that they were going to come in on Monday and, you know, say that they got hurt at work? Um, the employer knows the employee is active in recreational activities, so you might rely on tips from other coworkers or just your own observations, your own discussions with the employee. Um, work comp fraud indicators continued. Um, malingering. So they were injured on the job, so there, there's no question of that they were injured on the job but they continue to complain of pain longer than usual um, for this particular injury. All their complaints are just subjective, so there's no objective findings to it. They just keep saying, you know, it hurts, it hurts. Um, if they refuse or prolong diagnostic testing, so they're kind of trying to keep the claim going without really finding out what's going on, um, it may be a good time to utilize either surveillance or possibly an IME. Specific type of workers' compensation fraud, um, working while they're collecting benefits. Indicators of this might include, you know, they're never home when you call or somebody's answering the phone saying that, you know, they're in the shower, they just step, stepped outside, they'll have to call you back. Um, if the medical provider maybe observes dirty clothes or fingernails um, during their doctor's appointments, I do find that doctors, not all, but a lot of them will put a lot of um, extra things in the notes. It's not just strictly, you know, their findings on exam, they'll put observations in there, so that can be very useful. Um, and if they're missing scheduled doctor's appointments. Of course, everybody has, you know, they get sick or has family emergencies, but they should be going to their doctor's appointments. If they're not, that's definitely a red flag. So how can you as an employer reduce the risk of fraud? Um, verify their identification and background offering the modified work programs, which again, I can't stress how important that is, if you can get them back to some kind of work. Um, just keep them you know, involved, let them know, you know, ask them how they're doing. I can't tell you how many times as an adjuster, I would hear from people that you know, they're off work and it just nobody's been in touch with them. And it, it just helps for them to think that somebody cares, they're reaching out to them, just see how they're doing. And that's why if you have the, um, if you offer modified work, you can get them back in and talk to them on a regular basis and just kind of keep them so they feel part of, you know, the company. Um, obtain a photo ID of the employee at the time of hire. Um, this can become useful if surveillance is needed in the future. Once the referral is made to the surveillance vendor, they'll get in touch with the adjuster and they will ask for, you know, the address, what kind of car they drive, a physical description. So if you have, you know, a picture, they can just send that right over. It makes it a lot easier. And also just know your employees, know their interests, their hobbies, their employment background, you know, their friends within the company. And that's it. Okay, so we'd questions. like to certainly open it up for questions <clears throat> that, you, that you might have. And a couple of others have come in uh, during the presentation, so I'll, I'll walk Colleen through those now. So the first question was, with regards to fighting fraud, how effective are witness statements in helping to battle a potentially fraudulent worker's comp claim? I would say witness statements can be extremely helpful, but they have to be good witness statements. It can't just be, oh, I was working with John and he fell. You know, we need times, dates, and specifics. What were you doing? Did he say anything to you? You know, ouch, I, you know, we were lifting something. Okay, what were you lifting? 
and, you know, did he say anything? Oh, that hurt my back. Is there any kind of information like that? So getting a good witness statement can actually be very helpful, but it just has to be more specific than I often see comes from employers. Okay. And then I've also heard that one of the tactics used for, to fight fraud is to get multiple statements from the actual claimant to look for inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that tactic? I mean, I think that the best thing you can do is get a really thorough statement initially, which I know isn't always possible depending on, you know, the situation, but getting, a, you know, making them write down everything, not just, again, you know, I was working and I fell. Getting a thorough description with dates, times, what exactly they were, they were doing, what body part did they injure, I think that that's more helpful. But if you really feel that their story keeps changing, you know, maybe getting another statement from them, I just feel like for the injured employee, that's probably going to be kind of a red flag if you keep asking over and over. But um, if their story keeps changing, it may be something that could potentially be a benefit. Okay. Additional question. Um, have you seen success in re this, and this is go back to the surveillance, I, I would assume based upon the way the question is asked. Have you seen success in reducing the amount of a judgment or denying a claim as a result of surveillance or activities checks? I have. Um, it's Truthfully, it's not often, but I have seen it happen, especially when you get good surveillance. I had a claim I was working on when I was an adjuster where we had surveillance. Um, he did have a legitimate injury, and he had a back surgery, but his attorney and him were trying to say that he was permanently and totally disabled, so he could never come back to any type of work. So we had surveillance done on him, and the um, surveillance vendor was actually able to, they followed him to a courthouse and overheard him talking about how he had been arrested. So defense, um, you know, looked into it and it turned out that he had been in a bar fight and then got arrested for um, um, resisting arrest. So we were able to get all that information because, you know, it's public knowledge. We were able to get that. And then between our surveillance and that information, it helped to prove that, you know, he's saying he's permanently totally disabled, yet he's getting in bar fights and resisting arrest from police officers. So um, I have seen it happen. It's not all that often, but it definitely helps if you know, um, you know, they're working another job or outside activities that they're doing that they can really catch them doing something. Okay. Uh, question is, once an injury is reported, what can we as an employer do to ensure the best possible outcome for that particular claim? Okay. I think that's, that's a good question. It's important. From the onset of a claim, as soon as they're saying that, you know, they hurt themselves or something's hurting or they were injured, it's important to get, like I said, a full statement from them, any witnesses, their supervisor, and make them be as specific as possible. You know, what body part did they hurt? What were they doing? And I think just, you know, getting all that information over to the adjuster timely is important. And just, like I said, kind of keeping in touch with the employee, even if they're off work, you know, checking in with them, that really makes a huge difference for people. And, you know, you just kind of are also staying on top of, you know, them and letting them know that someone's watching, but just to make them feel like they're still, you know, someone cares and they're a part of the organization, I think is something that is huge that employers can do. Okay. Um, and then another question from a participant is, can you talk a little bit of how, what some of the best tactics to use to fight bogus or fraudulent claims? Hmm. Best tactics. Well, again, I mean, I think that goes back to making sure you get everything initially in the beginning of the claim, getting all the information, getting over to the adjuster, and keeping in touch with the employee and the adjuster. And then, um, you know, if you have information that would help with surveillance, that kind of stuff I think is very important. Just keeping in touch with the adjuster and letting them know I mean, again, the employer is the person that would see this person on a daily basis, so they know, you know, what's normal for them. They know their personality better. And just keeping the adjuster in the loop and giving them that extra information, I think, is, you know, can be very substantial for the claim. Okay. Would you also then be an advocate for fighting fraudulent claims of taking multiple witness statements and potentially, um, sorry, taking witness statements, potential, potential multiple statements, too, from the uh, claimant? would also think, too, that uh, drug testing mm -hmm. is an immediate need that happens at immediately after the, the, the claim occurs. Right. 
And if that's refused or delayed, then you, that's a fraud indicator as well. Right, definitely. And let the you know keeping the adjuster in the loop is important. So yeah, that's that's a good point with the um, post-accident drug screen, letting the adjuster know if they refuse to do it or if they failed it. You know, keeping them in the loop on that. But that's also a good um, a good thing, which I think most employers have that in place. But okay. Um, I think that does it for the incoming questions. So we would like to thank all the participants for their time today. Um, we'll leave the floor open for another couple seconds to see if any additional questions do come in. Otherwise, I will Kurt, turn like this I back have, over to Amanda. I do have a question that came in. Um, when do you feel the staffing company should be represented by its own counsel? We have seen situations where we feel a claim is fraud and the insurance company wants to settle and we disagree with both parties. That's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I think if it's something that you really are, you, you think it's fraud and you have legitimate concerns for it, then it might be a good idea to bring you know, in your counsel. But sometimes, unfortunately, the carrier will settle just because it's a lot cheaper than going to trial because trial costs are expensive. And I know that, you know, that sucks, especially when you really think that somebody, you know, it's a fraudulent claim, but often that's kind of the tactic that to take it to trial is just going to run up the, you know, the expense costs alone are going to run up. So sometimes that is why they just go ahead and settle for, you know, a disputed minimal amount. But I would say if it's something that you have substantial reason, not just, you know, we know this guy's a fraud. If you have evidence to that and they're not listening to you, then it might be a good time to bring in, you know, your own counsel to discuss it. Yeah, and hiring counsel is a really difficult uh, decision to make, and the insurance companies really despise when you involve your counsel. Now, if you're a large enough employer and you have the ability to dictate who your defense counsel is, we always recommend that you, it, during the negotiation with the insurance company that you do negotiate use of your own chosen defense counsel versus what's called their panel counsel. In many cases, it's an attorney that you're familiar with based on the community, somebody that, that knows your business and knows your employees better than what the panel counsel would be from the insurance carrier. So we would say that during the negotiation phase with the insurance company, it's imperative that that is brought up at that point. If you're paying $50,000 a year for your workers' comp coverage, odds are you're not going to be able to get panel or your, your defense counsel choice. Um, if you're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, there's a better chance. And certainly once you're up and taking risk in your program, like on a large deductible or retrospective program, then you certainly do have the ability to dictate who your defense counsel is. And you don't have to use the insurance company's defense. Uh, and that's, that's the best way is just deal with it up front so that you don't have their attorneys involved and you're using your own chosen counsel. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, we do have a couple of additional questions that came in. So this one is, we have several workers' comp cases that seem to be going on forever because a medical center seems to be assisting the employees with getting additional visits and follow-up treatments even though the original injury was very minor. It's a pattern with most of our open claims. What's your advice on this? Should we change or cancel our agreement with this medical uh, with, the, with the clinic, or will this most likely continue no matter who uses our medical center or send injured employees to? Lengthy question. It's, yeah, lengthy it's, answer, most it's likely. It's an interesting question. I guess if you really feel that this clinic is, because there are clinics out there that will run up costs because they know it's work comp, so they'll get paid for it. So if you really feel like it is the clinic, then I would maybe think about terminating your you know contract with them. Otherwise, I definitely think it's something. I'm sure you've talked to the adjusters about, but getting an IME, that's where that really comes in handy and cutting that, you know, cutting off the treatment. If you really feel that, you know, it's just going on and on, it's not necessary, that should be something that the adjuster is doing. Yeah, and we feel very strongly that you should interview all of your all of your clinics that you're using. And if you have a large concentration of employees in a particular area and you can choose which immediate clinic that you can use for uh, workers' comp treatment, Deal with one that's treating your employees in the way that you want to see them treated and is more employer-centric than employee-centric. So if you're in a more populated area and you have choices, then absolutely cut off that clinic and go find somebody who can and interview them. You have every right to talk to that clinic and that management about how they 
what, what their view is related to treating workers' comp injuries, because you will find those that are very employer-centric versus those that are employee-centric, and it can make a huge difference in the cost of the claim. Um, most of the insurance companies will have online a list of clinics that they have authorized. We don't always agree with using one of those. It may see some immediate cost savings because they've got negotiated PPO discounts, but it may not ultimately be the best case for you in the long term. Uh, because even though it's an uh, insurance company chosen uh, clinic, it still may not be the best option. Um, and it's also, I think, important, too, related to return to work, that the, cl the doctors at the clinic understand what your return to work and light duty capabilities are. Yep. So that if you can get a physician in your office and they can see what your light duty opportunities are, they will be more inclined to release people to light duty knowing that you, you can fill certain restrictions. Um, so that's another part of the, of the discussions with the clinics themselves. Anything there, Colleen? No, I mean, I agree, and um, I think definitely getting one a doctor in that can look at your facility and letting them know if you do have modified work that you have it, because often um, injured workers will go in, you know, to their doctor or clinic and say that there isn't any, you know, modified duty. Sometimes they're lying. Sometimes they just don't know that there is. So that's important to communicate with whatever, you know, clinic or facility that you're using. Okay. Another question came in. Is there anything that can be done with a claimant when a claimant fails a drug test? We had a situation where the employee was terminated and a few days later filed a claim. It was never reported during his tenure. Unfortunately, that, well, that varies by jurisdiction a lot. Um, so that would be something I would talk with the adjuster about or defense counsel, but um, often, just failing a drug screen does not mean that their claim can be denied. I, I, I haven't really seen that very much, to be honest, um, especially depending on what the drug screen is positive for. Um, it, you know, if they test positive for, you know, marijuana on their system, you know, when did they use it? Were they under the influence at that time? There's just too much. Usually, it has to be that they were, you know, so significantly, significantly impaired that um, there was no other cause of the injury but basically the substance, um, which is unfortunate and frustrating. I realize that. But, again, it does vary by jurisdiction, the law, with regards to that. So that's something I would definitely talk to um, defense counsel and or your adjuster about. Yeah, and in my experience, it's extremely difficult to get a claim denied solely based on the fact that an employee failed a drug test. Um, what we typically find is that the 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 drug use or the alcohol use has to be the proximate cause of the accident. So the accident would not have occurred in the absence of the influence of the, the alcohol or drugs. And it's a really difficult standard to maintain and, and prove. So, you know, certainly it's another thing that we can use to document and fight the claim with, but as a sole basis of denying the claim, we rarely find that it, it, it works for that purpose. Very rarely. It's frustrating. I can understand that, but it's it's very hard to fence to to use. Okay, I think that does it for questions. Um, unless anything else has come in on your end, Amanda? No, uh, that, we'll turn that this, we'll turn it back over terrible. to you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to thank um, our presenters today, Colleen and Kurt, for sharing their information and knowledge on workers' comp claims management. We will have a recording available on our website at www.tricom.com slash resources. Should you have any questions or would like additional information, please feel free to contact um, either of us directly. The contact information is up on the screen. We thank you so much for your participation in the webinar today and for all your great questions. Watch for information on our next webinar session, which will be held December 12th, on preparing for year-end. Thank you very much.